Hello, I'm Dr. Karen Edwards, president of Clark College, and I'm honored to be part of this year's powwow, Educating for the Seventh Generation. Educating for the Seventh Generation references our responsibility to teach the future seven generations to maintain resources, traditions, and customs. Clark College has hosted this annual event since 2009. As the COVID pandemic continues to impact us, we're not able to hold the event in person, rather it will be virtual. Traditionally, powwows are a sacred social gathering held by many North American indigenous communities. In modern times, powwows have become events where these communities and their guests can honor their culture and heritage while also connecting and spending time with others. Powwows like the one held annually on Clark College main campus often showcases singing, dancing, and drumming. Our event also provides a space for us to honor Indigenous veterans and to present the Dreamcatcher Scholarship, which is awarded annually to a Clark College student of Indigenous ancestry. We hold this event each November to honor Native American Heritage Month. Since 1994, this month of acknowledgement has encouraged us to celebrate the Indigenous people on whose ancestral lands we reside and the rich histories and cultures impacts of their communities. At Clark, we expand this celebration beyond November. We feel it's important to recognize that our, campus, our, our campuses are located on these ancestral lands of the Cowlitz tribe, the Chinook tribe, and the Lower Columbia peoples. As stated in our land acknowledgement, we pay respects to indigenous elders who have stewarded these lands, past and present. We recognize their strength and resilience and consider their legacy as we strive to raise awareness of the rich cultural history of our region. I wish we could gather in person together on our main campus for this important event. And I also understand how important it is for us to consider community health and safety. The COVID-19 pandemic has disproportionately impacted indigenous people and the long-term impacts of this are immeasurable. Because of this, it is more important that, than ever that we gather and celebrate community and heritage. We hope that this virtual celebration and review of past events evokes a sense of belonging and an appreciation of the diversity within the indigenous communities in Southwest Washington. Thank you so much for attending our celebration, and I encourage you to continue to learn about indigenous communities and how our indigenous friends and neighbors would like to be recognized, valued, and supported. Enjoy. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
My name is Duanna Johnson. My pronouns are she, her. I am a Colville tribal member, and I am here before you to give my voice to the missing and murdered sisters. Violence against women has been a long-standing issue that needs to be addressed in the United States. And for some women, this violence is more prevalent. We indigenous women face the highest rate per capita out of any other race. Statistical data is complicated by inaccurate or the absence of race documentation, misreporting of gender, and underreporting by victims. Nevertheless, the current data available provides context that illustrates the necessity of community, community engagements like this to help increase awareness and address all types of violence against Indigenous women. Because when compared to the national average, Indigenous women are two and a half times more likely to be assaulted, two times more likely to be stalked, five times more likely to experience interracial violence, ten times more likely to be murdered. Six in ten Indigenous women will be physically assaulted. Indigenous mothers are 35% more likely to be murdered than any other MMIWs. Our women are vanishing. These statistics reflect the normalization of violence against Indigenous women in this country. Native American women have been counted as missing or murdered in Washington State more than any other race. Indian law attorney Sarah Deer notes that predators may target Native women and girls precisely because they are perceived as marginalized and outside the protections of American legal systems. Jurisdictional issues as well as federal law and boundaries affect us in tragic ways. The statistics about violence against Indigenous women is alarming. However, the lack of general awareness is equally, if not more, alarming. Disturbingly, these challenges have formed a dangerous environment where Indigenous women have been made targets of victimization. Sex trafficking in Indian country began upon the first contact with colonizers and continues as part of our reality today. One of the earliest documented trafficking situations was with Columbus when he took our women and children aboard his ships in 1492. Sadly, we are and were never seen as human citizens of our own lands. This fact has contributed greatly to the genocidal effects of indigenous women being invisible, therefore targeted for victimization without consequences to the perpetrators. This is not just a tribal reservation issue. This is an issue that affects our own urban towns, cities, and even whole states. It is time for all people to ask for our local states and government, even the federal government, for more adequately tracking to address violence against indigenous women. As of 2018, there was no database system in the United States that tracks how many indigenous women have been abducted and murdered. Families are frequently left wondering about their missing loved ones for years or even decades without acknowledgement from law enforcement or national data reporting. This coupled with the misreporting situations of MMIW sadly brings me to say this. The wording that is used to describe MMIW is so important. For example, using the word runaway to describe what happened or where an MMIW is. 
Why would the first words include runaway? Part of this is part of the problem because the word puts the blame on the missing person and does nothing in to aid in the helping of finding them. It's called victim blaming or shaming. Even if a missing person runs away, there is a reason for it, and labeling them as a runaway puts a target on them, thus making them easier to be preyed upon by those that would want to do harm because they are already unseen and vulnerable. You may ask, are indigenous women being targeted because of the general population isn't paying attention? Yeah. Yes, we are and have been targeted since 1492. Pa Papa Bulls from 1100 to the 1800s. The Doctrine of Discovery in 1493 manifest destiny. In 1831, the Supreme Court ruled that tribes are domesticated dependent nations. Natives are not considered U.S. citizens nor independent nations. In 1830, President Andrew Jackson enacted the Trail of Tears. There are so many more examples of these abuses we sustained that made our women and young girls invisible, therefore easy targets. The over-sexualization -sexu and degradation of our women and young girls in books, movies, TV, media, ads for clothing, costumes, making us into fictionalized characters has played a huge part in our disappearances. For example, Pocahontas and Sacagawea. Did you know they were both under the age of 15 when they were taken? Disney did us no favors. This speaks volumes as to why there is little to no media attention when one of our loved ones goes missing and or murdered. So the backlash from national media not covered, not covering our missing and murdered, they started doing it and four women were found over the weekend. This is just this past weekend. Some murdered, some murdered, some had been trafficked for over a year now. They are safe and, be, and healing. We are 1.8 of the American population, but most, almost 30% of the murderers. Murder is the number three, co number three cause of death of our women. But nobody has given a care for hundreds of years. That's why we exist as an organization. We actively search, investigate, advocate for the women and families. We don't just post people. We're doing something about it. In light of the new discoveries in the well-covered Gabby Petito case, we are releasing an official statement on our stance towards the case and the relevant issues surrounding it regarding race equity and the handling of missing persons cases. We are currently overwhelmed with the media contact. Feel free to incite this statement in any articles you may publish. First, we want to extend our love and prayers to Gabby, Gabby Petito family Losing a family member in this matter is one of the most painful things a family can go through. We work with the families who deal with this every single day, and some of us in this organization have been impacted by it ourselves. There are no words to express the pain that this brings, and we hope and pray for the justice for everyone who has suffered in this way, including Gabby Petito's family, among many others both those names we know and whose names we do not know. With that being said, the media coverage of Gabby's case has shed light upon the inequity of the broader United States that people have been talking about in Indian country. 
for years. Native women and children and other people of color are often not given the attention and the assistance they need when they go missing. Gabby has been covered on every news outlet in the United States and even internationally, but our own women and children don't get the same kind of support. There have been many devastating cases across Indian country that have never made the mainstream news. Those cases getting media attention and law enforcement attention could have made the difference in someone's life being saved. We know that media attention leads to community action and community action plays a huge role in getting people home safely. How can the community help if they don't know a person is missing? We can try to supplement supplement this need with flyers, marches, organized groups on the ground, but we need media to fill in the gaps. We need law enforcement to step up and start taking Native women's disappearance seriously. We need the biases based on negative stereotypes about our culture, lifestyles, and traumas to be removed from the police departments. We need media to start talking about our disappearances, to pay attention to us and to other communities of color and start speaking up and talking about our cases. We need communities to keep their eyes out for missing people. Pay attention to what's in the news. Pay attention to who's in your state's missing person clearinghouse or bulletins. Start getting feet on the ground, reach out to news stations, participate in searches, put up flyers, talk to your kids and friends and family about this issue. We need people to be willing to come forward with information. Fixing this issue requires law enforcement to take communities seriously and respect us. And it requires us to be willing to reach out to them and work with them as well as the families of the missing. To the people who have been supporting us, thank you for your continued support and help. We thank those who are on the ground doing the work that has been done to fix this. To the law enforcement officers and media representatives who've been taking the issue seriously, we appreciate you and thank you. Let us use Gabby's case as a way to encourage change now that now is the time to start stepping up. We hope that this clarifies our stance and answers some questions that you all have about what we think needs to be done to solve this issue. Any further questions can be directed to the Facebook inbox. We will, tr we will try our best to answer questions. With love and blessings, the MMIW USA team. You may ask how you can help raise public awareness for MMIW and their families. By making this a heed, a call to action, by taking the following steps in your communities, work with local indigenous communities to hold vigils and events, having an MMIW speaker to come and educate, like I'm doing now. We can... Supplement this need with flyers, marches, and organized groups on the ground. But we need our media to fill in the gaps. I can't say that enough. Repost alerts of MMIW using the hashtag MMIW, hashtag not invisible, and hashtag no more stolen sisters. You can help create safe spaces and be aware if you see something, say something. And in closing, being a Native American woman, there's a target on my back. If I ever go somewhere and I don't come back when I said I would, know that I did not just leave. I would not do that to my loved ones. If I ever go missing and something is wrong, please look for me.
and with the help of many amazing people that have been on this council for a long time and support, uh, Anne used her faculty power to really push for us to be here tonight. So, um, and we miss you. Hi, I'm Katerina Salazar. I'm from the tribe system Wapton in Lake Traverse. I'm Dakota Sioux. And my Indian name is Wamdi Hawashtenwi. I graduated from the arts and academics. I later went on to Clark College, graduated, and I'm currently going to Central Washington University where I made it onto the Dean's List. I received the Dreamcatcher Scholarship twice, and thankfully because of it, I was able to pay for my school supplies my textbooks in order to achieve. I would encourage all Indigenous students, even those who fall between the cracks, to apply for the scholarship. I'm thankful for my heritage and the support I received from the Dreamcatcher Scholarship. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
name is Anna Shimazo. My, my family name is St. John. I'm a member of the Lake Traverse Reservation from South Dakota. Um, I am Dakota Sioux uh, from the Wachetti uh, Shagoni, which is really the Sioux tribe that is known by the, the natives themselves. The Sioux is, uh, was given to us. So what I wanted to talk about today was the boarding school, the, the, the tribal boarding schools. I have uh, September 30th is uh, National Remembrance Day for for the survivors and those that died in the in, in the care of the uh, uh, boarding schools. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's a remembrance for both those that died and those that survived. Um, and the first boarding school was actually built, well opened in the state of Washington in 1860 on the Yakima Reservation. And from that point, many reservations that uh, were, schools appeared on all the reservations and a lot of them were BIA government uh, boarding schools and day schools. And uh, then the various uh, religious organizations that uh, also opened up boarding schools um, for indigenous people. So um, this was my, in, in my instance, I, I hear people say, oh, well, they were offered, they were taken, the uh, parents were uh, were kind of coerced into taking the kids into the care of the boarding schools. Um, and it was sad on both sides, the parents leaving and, and the children staying behind. Um, but soon the many uh, uh, boarding schools, um, were like the day, the, I think the day, the day schools were the more popular ones because then the kids could go home at night. Otherwise, the boarding schools were um, kind of like far away from home, off the reservation uh, or on other reservations where they had to travel miles. Um, so the the school, I don't know, the, 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 the saying, um, uh, kill the Indian and save the child, was one of the reasons why the boarding schools were opened up. And if anybody knows about the Dawes Act, the Dawes Act was part of that um, reservation, putting the kids, taking them out of the homes and putting them on the reservations to, I mean, the boarding schools off reservations to um, get rid of their culture, their language, and make them more into the dominant culture, the dominant society. So um, the Dawes Act, um, the, as part of the Indian, it's kind of like a, where they were given allotments of land to um, be farmers and gardeners or whatever. Um, the so the Dawes Act uh, joined the boarding schools and said eight years is plenty of time for the students to be off the reservations and in boarding schools, uh, learning English, becoming proficient in English, and uh, learning the dominant culture's way of life. Um, this way, eight years uh, is enough time. And so they, what they did was they, they also um, said by the end of that eight years, they would have six years of elementary education, six, <laughs> up to the sixth grade uh, in, uh, education, and they will have learned their English and were ready to move on. And the next part was going into uh, a vocation. That was the next part of the boarding school. After the eight years, they went more um, to like Carlisle and stuff for vocational training. Um, so the boarding school really opened in 18, the 18, uh, 17, 1879 to the current. Um, there are still boarding schools open today, um, but the funding is limited. They don't have as much funding. And I'm not really sure if it's because of this, uh, these groups that are helping survivors of boarding school life to uh, readjust and become healthy again. Um, so, and 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 now, uh, a day like September 30th is is um, uh, the day to remember, and I think there's a lot of other orange things happening for today, but for the boarding school survivors and uh, and acknowledging the deceased, um, wearing orange, at least it's a step forward and a step, and, and showing people unity and finding a way to recover 
and heal in front of the boarding school. Um, yours days a day like September thirtieth, and wearing orange to remember the survivors and recognizing those that were killed by the toxic environment uh, is good medicine and a, and a road to healing. Recognizing these traumas, which are also known as the hidden traumas um, of boarding school life, bringing them to light and uh, on, the, on the path to healing. Uh, my Both of my parents were boarding school survivors, uh, now deceased, and I am a boarding school survivor. I am a survivor. As we know, November has now been declared Native American Heritage Month. And it's just an opportunity, I believe, for Native Americans to share our culture, some of our traditions, some of the ceremony, some of the protocols, things like that, that not everyone has a chance to see in, in um, our experience. And take the mystic piece out of being Native American, the fantasy piece out of being Native American, but to truly show that Native Americans are not only alive and have survived, they're educated. They are doctors and lawyers and judges and politicians and great teachers and moms and dads and, you know, awesome, wonderful people. There will be uh, the fry bread taco feed. Uh, a lot of our tribes always believe in feeding the people. It's part of the celebration, part of a gathering or part of a ceremony. And so there'll be the feed and then there'll be the grand entry with the veterans leading the procession of dancers. And there will be different um, dance styles because there are different tribes that are represented and they dance differently. They speak different languages. There's, you know, numerous differences. It takes time to, to actually teach and educate non-native people, non-indigenous people of our protocols and our ways. And um, I think that each year something else is learned, something is shared, and I really believe that you know the support of the college and the willingness for them to learn and you know will only create something better for each year. It's just growing and growing. Thank <laughs> you. 